and that Smuts wrote a review of the British Air Services. Now, obviously, eponymously, this was known as the Smuts Report. The formation of the RAF in 1918 was directly influenced by Smuts' report. Smuts was a South African general and later field marshal who, because of his work and with interests, was invited to join David Lord George's Imperial War Cabinet in, um, in 1917. Smuts' recommendation to the cabinet was for an independent air force. Now, this was counter to the arguments put forward both by the army and navy at the time, who were competing for direct control of the air force. Smuts considered the uh, problems facing Britain during World War I and arrived at what he considered to be the best outcome for an air force. The War Cabinet accepted his report and then on the 29th of November 1917, the RAF was formed by merging the RAF, sorry, the RFC, which my great grandfather was uh, a member of, and the RNAS, the Royal Naval Air Services. Smuts was far-sighted in his vision of the future of defence and the need for a strong air power. And as you can see here, the, the RFC's activities effectively revolved into the activities of the, the, uh, the RAF. After World War I, Caddell was joined Vickers Aviation as an industrialist. He moved from, uh, you know, from a military background to an industrial background. Uh, he was in a very prominent position, I think, in the aviation section of Vickers as their head of sales. And he also sat on the board of Vickers. Uh, he lived a short distance from uh, Vickers HQ in Knightsbridge. He's a very, well, look at it, <laughs> nice flat where he lived. Um, and Vickers itself um, was um, uh, uh, only a short walk from the government offices of Whitehall and, uh, uh, and it meant that Caddell was easily available for meetings or discussions with the ministry. And I think his knowledge of artillery, his interest in aviation design, his network, his war record and reputation were all beneficial to Vickers, so they just jumped on the, the opportunity, I think. And as it says in his obituary, uh, Caddell's obituary, he was a good mixer and he got on well with lots of people. So he could mix between you know, his military background, the ministry and, and his, his industrial uh, direction. Um, uh, Vickers benefited directly from these relations. And I show Hugh Trenchard here. Hugh Trenchard was the recently appointed first head of the RAF. And Trenchard wanted to build up the bomber capability. His main interest was bomber capability, Trenchard's, um, which Vickers duly directed their attention towards. Meanwhile, other smaller businesses like Supermarine uh, suffered significantly after the war with few orders and without the kind of leverage that I think Vickers enjoyed, both in terms of connection and proximity. Here you see Vickers Vimy, first flown in 1917. It was a heavy bomber developed during the latter stages of World War I uh, for the RFC, but it was largely too late for active bombing service, but it became the core of the RAF's heavy bomber force through the 1920s. The Vimy achieved success both as a military and also in civil aviation. Um, Alcock and Brown famously became the first people to fly non-stop across the Atlantic. Yes, you've guessed it, in a Vimy. And for this little piece, I'd like to just read the report of Alcock and Brown, who were invited to the Aero Club in London with all the great and the good. And it was reported in the Times in 1919, a few days after their famous flight. And Brigadier General Sir Holden said, these men, they appreciate that we appreciate what they've done, but they don't yet appreciate themselves what they've done. 
It was one of the most remarkable feats of the century thus far, and one which would be remembered as long as the world lasted. Only nine years since Blerio crossed the channel, only 20 miles, these men flew 2,000 miles non-stop in that aircraft. At which point Captain Alcock stood on his chair at the Aero Club in London and said, I should like to thank General Holden for your kind words about Lieutenant Brown and I. And I'd like to say that the Rolls-Royce engine is absolutely in everything. If the engine goes well, then there's nothing to prevent us getting across. So long as Lieutenant Brown can see where he's going. And anyway, here we are. So it must have been okay. They all laughed. Thank you very much indeed for your kind welcome, said Lieutenant Brown. First of all, I'd like to thank the design of the machine by Messrs Vickers. And then second, the engines by Rolls-Royce. Thirdly, the instruments with which the machine is equipped. And last but not least, the pilot, Captain Alcock for which all things the machine could not have made a successful flight without him. And the world of flight, bottom left, is quite an interesting little uh, nuance on the story. Um, and it's commentary from the London News, and it's that Caddle seemed to be using the event as an opportunity to sell aeroplanes rather than congratulating the airmen. Every time somebody turned around, would you like to buy one? There was also a successful flight to Australia, five months later in a converted Vimmer bomber, Vimy bomber, with the registration, God help all of us, God help all of us was its registration, flew to Australia, the first flight of its kind, captained by, crewed by Captain Ross McPherson Smith and his brother, the Vimy left Hounslow Heath, now known I think you might know it as Heathrow Airport on the 12th of November 1919 and it flew via many locations all the way down to Darwin Ten month, and a month later in December arrived covering 11,000 miles and averaging about 82 miles per hour. It was a prize, there was a lot of prize money both for the um, non-stop but also this particular flight there were significant prize money to encourage the daring airmen the smith brothers were each knighted and the aircraft was presented to the australian government no doubt uh, my great grandfather had a hand in that as well uh, and i think the prize money was awarded by the daily mail these early flights were very important because they set the paths for both international air routes and the formation of air mail they connected the empire and also helped with diplomatic relations. Um, at the time, much celebration was made of the pioneering airmen and Caddell seemed to be at every dinner, every event with a distinguished guest mixing with the great and the good. Clearly he met Churchill, the future King George VI and every person involved in aviation, be they flyer, industrialist, ministry or politician. The head of the RAF, Hugh Trenchard, realised that the empire was better policed from the ground, than, from the air, sorry, than from the ground troops, World War I's experience. Air routes were opened up between the empire staging posts and key cities, following on from what we've just seen. Also, it was realised that air mail and supplies could be quickly sent around the world and a transport version of the Vimy called the Vernon was developed. It could carry troops and supplies and it was powered by the engines of the time and there it is. Let's just put the laser pointer back on, here we are. The first commercial passenger businesses also evolved. These heavies, as they were known in Vickers, kept the business afloat during these tough times after the First World War. Some notable aircraft from Vickers were the, the Vixen and its evolution, the Vespa. Now the Vespa attained the world altitude record in of its time with 44,000 feet in 1934. Also, bottom right hand corner, we see 
uh, an interesting aircraft, the torpedo bomber, the wildebeest. Now the evolution of these aircraft was clear. They were a successful flock and served for many years as frontline RAF workhorses, right up to 1938, when this type of biplane was replaced by none other than the Wellington bomber. Another little diversion I want to just introduce you to for a minute is in 1922, uh, a Frenchman by the name of Michel Wibo began consulting for Vickers. Then, later in 1925, Wibo uh, joined the company when uh, Vickers bought Wibo's patent. Um, the patent was for duraluminium, uh, duraluminium uh, monocoque approach. Cattle, I understand, had been banging on about monocoques to the Vickers board for some time. Clearly, he'd seen that the aircraft for himself in air shows of 1919 and 1920 that just started after the war. Weibo was already building monocoque monoplanes and he had seen the aircraft for himself in the 1920s. Vickers obviously recognised the benefits of aluminium over their wooden construction techniques, its durability. Uh, it was actually quicker to build using aluminium, and it doesn't matter if it gets wet either, which is quite an important thing for a, a flying boat or a seaplane. Weibo was a brilliant engineer, um, a very important man, um, who is also famed for going on to develop himself the vectored thrust system needed for vertical takeoff and landing as used on the Harrier, which you all know about. The Weibo Scout 121 monoplane was commercially successful and sold worldwide, but also to the Chilean Air Force. The Vickers Virio and Jockey Fighters were fitted with, yes, the Constantinescu synchronization geared gun. Also the Viastra, a, develop, a commercial development onwards and lengthened, as you can see, was a 12 seater passenger aircraft that was sold uh, to the Australians and flew back and forth between Perth and Adelaide for many, many years. So next, I'd like to move on to the, uh, this particular point. Here we go. In 1919, Vickers developed and then successfully sold 31 Vickers Viking flying boats to Britain, Argentina, Canada, France and Holland. So it was a well sold aeroplane. Sir John Alcock, who I introduced you to early, who'd recently crossed the Atlantic, was sadly killed in one of these aircraft when he crashed in fog in France on his way to an air show in Paris. Sir Ross Smith, who'd flown to Australia with his brother later on in 19. This was a short-lived departure. And so into Supermarine. Supermarine in 1928 were already in financial difficulty and Vickers bought them out for less than £400,000. It was very good value for money for them and it also helped rescue uh, Supermarine. Um, and in doing so they acquired collaboratively not only a seaplane business with a good flying safety record unlike Vickers's experiences but also and famously now the genius of who is Reginald J Mitchell. And under the command of Mitchell's design, Supermarine built many aircraft, which I'm afraid to say I, I felt were more, are more one-offs for the RAF, the Navy, but also commercial. And while Vickers carried huge industrial might, Supermarine had the agility to redesign quickly. Um, plus ça change. Nothing changes, does it? Small, agile Supermarine could respond quickly. Lumbering Vickers selling lots of aeroplanes couldn't. It was a match made, made correct. Uh, the letter on the right that you see here is a letter to Imperial Airways Limited in 1930 from my great grandfather and it's for single engine amphibious commercial aircraft. I think probably a seagull being single engined and modified for civil purposes. Cattle would seize the opportunity to convert military 
applications into commercial use wherever it arose. And he must have been doing quite well because in Grace's Who's Who of Aviation in 1933, he'd gone up in the world, moving to a larger house in Beckenham. And there it is. Um, now, here I just want to give you a very brief history of Supermarine, which is a, an entire topic in itself. And I'll start not at the beginning of Supermarine, but in 1913. They seem to focus more on uh, the smaller end of the market, as I've said. And I'll start with this little aircraft here, the N1 Baby Pusher. Pusher because the propeller is at the rear of the, uh, the wing, wings there. And now the N1 Baby had folding wings and it was designed to fly from early, uh, put the laser pointer on, designed to fly from the early aircraft carriers of its time. In 1919, Supermarine Sea Lion, um, uh, there's the... Uh, the com commercial amphibian, which was a, a, an attempt. And then also in 1919, the sea line was developed from the N1 Baby, but much the same aircraft with fixed wings and uh, a, a larger engine, bringing on board Napier, the, uh, uh, the Napier engine. The original sea line one had 450 horsepower. This was the sea line two for, for, for over 500 horsepower. And that's a, a thread that they're gradually pushing more and more power from the engines. Um, the Sea Lion 2 figured in the Schneider Trophy race which, race, which I'll come on to shortly. The Swan was a 12 seater passenger. Quite how you can get 12 seat people in this, I do not know. But interestingly, the Supermarine Southampton was a twin engined, twin Lion, Napier Lion engined aircraft designed by Mitchell and one of the most successful aircraft in its class, both sales and reliability wise, and at its time delivered to the RAF and served as a long distance maritime patrol aircraft. Most famously, it flew the 1927 long distance flight all the way to Hong Kong. But sadly, that commercial venture in the letter earlier didn't make it off the drawing board. Now, I'd like to thank um, David Key of Hersey Park for this one. Um, it's the catapult story and uh, it's perhaps a bit of a diversion, but I, I had to introduce it because it's such a lovely story. Um, Caddle, as part of Sir Robert McLean's team that oversaw the Weybridge and Southampton activities of Vickers Supermarine, um, was the representative of the business at the time, attending you know, air shows, the Schneider Trophy race, and listed as the representative of Vic Vickers in the documentation. Now, I have an account here from Air Marshal Williams at the time on how this particular aircraft that I'm showing on screen now, um, which was a catapult aircraft, was the testing didn't go quite as smoothly as they'd hoped. And I read, we didn't get much information on progress with this particular aircraft, said Air Marshal Williams. And consequently, it was the first thing I inquired on reaching London. Vickers Aviation representative at the time was Caddle. And when I contacted him regarding the prototype, he didn't know and suggested we might go to Southampton to see for ourselves. We found a large contract from the Air Ministry of 12 Scarpers had caused the Seagull to be pushed to the back of the workshop. I informed Cuddle of our need for the aircraft and he undertook to have the prototype completed. Not long afterwards, Cuddle rang me to report that the Seagull had completed its flying trials. And he asked for an order. I said, and I drew his attention to the fact that it had yet to be catapult tested. His reply was that he did not think that necessary. Provision had been made and lugs to take the catapult mechanism had been incorporated. And he finished by saying, after all, old man, we've been in the aircraft business a lot longer than you, you know. And I said, I was aware of that fact, but I, didn't re but I did really need it to be catapult tested and that I was not prepared to take an order without that being done. Two days later, Cad ran me to say uh, he had not been able to get a catapult and there was only one available at Farnborough. So I approached the RAF who said they were not interested in an aircraft of this type. 
nor is the Navy, and we're not prepared to pay for the test either. I told Caddle that the Ministry had no money and Vickers should pay themselves. Caddle said, leave it to me and I'll see what I can do. The next day he advised me that Vickers would pay and overhaul the catapult, the RAF catapult. In due course, this work was completed and the Seagull 5 went to Farnborough for catapult testing. I myself couldn't attend, he writes, but Caddle, he expected Caddle to ring him immediately afterwards. Well, he didn't, so he rang him the day later, only to learn that the aircraft catapult lugs had buckled in testing. The necessary strengthening modifications took some time but were made in due course and the aircraft duly passed its catapult test. After all, old man, we've been in this aircraft business a lot longer, you know. What about a bloody order? That's what stuck in my head. And initially, David Key wrote to me and said, the Royal Navy were ne could never see the point of this particular aircraft. That is until the Australians went and ordered one. The Navy realized its value they renamed it the Walrus or the Shagbat. Don't ask me where that name comes from. Somebody will know. Um, and this particular aircraft became really important because it duly went off to be catapulted off half the Royal Navy ships during World War II. It became an essential piece of kit, both for observation, gunnery, and also air sea rescue. And it worked alongside the Spitfire. A Spitfire would spot a downed pilot or whatever, and would radio back to the aircraft, the walrus would take off, land on the sea and pick up the unfortunate pilots. A very successful aircraft that saved many a pilot's life during World War II. So on to the air race. Jacques Schneider, seen here, Jacques Schneider, seen here, uh, was born the same year as my great-grandfather in 1879. Schneider inherited the French arm and, and engineering business. He was a wealthy man and amongst many other exploits, such as ballooning, seen here, sponsored the eponymous air race. The trophy is a large silver and bronze, bronze piece that you can now find in the Science Museum today. The purpose of the race was to encourage the development of seaplanes and flying boats. Held every year, the winner was responsible for organising the event in their own country the following year. Um, later on, the rules were changed and it became a biennial to allow more time for aircraft development. But if a country won three years on the trot, then they would hold the trophy outright and the whole game was over. So that was the, the rules of the Schneider Trophy. In fact, some of the rules changed uh, to incorporate safety testing and uh, you know, more carrying more fuel, this sort of thing, but essentially that's what it was. It was a very important race because it was significant in advancing both aeroplane design, but also, uh, you know, the, the physics, aerodynamics, fluid mechanics, and also encouraging engine reliability and power improvements, uh, as well as critically, uh, and, and of the time, uh, a key feature, aircraft cooling systems. At these races, aircraft designers, the manufacturers and the airmen could all see for themselves what technologies were being developed during the, the, the 20s and early 30s. So it was much a trade fair as well as a global leveller of for performance aircraft. Um, and I'm absolutely certain that an early Le Bourget or Farmer air show in itself for, well, my great grandfather selling aeroplanes. So while the race courses were different Depending on the location, the race was always going to be run as a time trial. The first race was run in Monaco in 1913 and was won by the French, while Britain didn't take part in that particular event. Then, and unexpectedly the following year in 1914, um, a Sopwith um, entry was made uh, and they called it the Sopwith tabloid. Essentially, it was the existing Sopwith. Uh, they just took the wheels off and put floats on it. Tom Sopwith was a major player amongst British aviators. 
in the, in the day and a small scout aircraft uh, nicknamed the tabloid was adapted. There we are. After the war, there was, during the war, there was a gap, obviously, and after the war, aircraft designs moved on significantly. The race convened in Britain, as I said earlier, uh, the winner of a particular race was responsible for organizing the following year. In 1919, after the war, the race was convened in Britain, in, in Pool Bay. And this is where the story of Supermarine's involvement begins uh, uh, with the Sea Lion, developed from that N1 baby, designed by Har FJ Hargreaves, and he was soon replaced by his understudy, Mitchell. The 1919 contest in Pool Bay didn't go too well. Thick mist hung around the, the bay all day. Um, the first two competitors, um, unfortunately, returned home saying it was far too dangerous. The, uh, the sea lion took off and was holed um, uh, during takeoff and unfortunately sank, um, while neither of the French aircraft uh, was fit to fly. That year was won by an Italian in his Savoia. Um, however, he didn't win because while it was foggy, he went round the course and he mistook a boat as a turning point turned it and afterwards they reported he hadn't completed the course so nobody won that year. The only winner of course being the British weather. The 1920 and 21 events were not offended by the Britons so I'll skip over those. The 1922 event was held in Naples and saw a renewed effort, a renewed effort by Supermarine. It was the beg, steal and borrow year. £6,000 came from Scott Payne's private purse they borrowed the engine off Napier. Meanwhile, the government pled poverty. So the only, uh, uh, the only entrant from Britain was Supermarine. Of course, other air, they were allowed up to three uh, entries for each country. Uh, the Sea Lion II was itself a refurbished Sea King. Um, and uh, the Sea King II won easily because the only other competition, the Italian, capsized during practice. Um, now, being made of wood, and other such mater uh, absorbent materials. They tried to dry it out in, for this particular race, um, but uh, it didn't work too well. But So Britain won. In 1923 at Cowes, back on home waters, a largely straight out and back course across the Solent was devised. B Beard, uh, um, the test pilot for Supermarine, was going to pilot the sea lion again with its, you can see it had a large bow with uh, painted as a sea lion. Um, and this particular aircraft got to aquaplane very easily at low speeds. It was easy to get off the water. While other British entries failed that year, one pilot drowned <laughs> nearly, I, I happen to ha add, um, and his aircraft poor poised and failed to take off and sank while the Sopwith crashed on land. However, the American Curtis won easily that year. So what was special about the Curtis? In 1923 and, and for the next year, uh, the Americans had been working very hard. Um, they had an injection of $2 million uh, directly from the American government, which helped ref them refine their aircraft. Um, and they, the entry was a, a modification of the CR6. Uh, you can see it has a duraluminium propeller, not a wooden one. There's the beginnings of um, aerodynamic fairing around the, the engine. And it was the first aircraft to incorporate uh, the radiator panels into the wings. Um, it was a fully fledged seaplane, not a flying boat. Namely, it had floats and it took off from the floats rather than the hull of the aircraft. Um, and it had a V12 water cooled engine. The 1924 event was cancelled. Um, proposed by France, but all the other countries agreed. Uh, so that was that. In 1925, they went back to the USA winner that Curtis had won. Um, 
Supermarine, now with Mitchell, very much in charge of design, went back to the drawing board and they came up with the S4 monoplane and that was born. Although entirely of wood, it was monocoque and had the duraluminium propeller, streamlining, two wooden floats, and it was a true seaplane, not a flying boat. It also had the uprated Napier Lion engine. Four power was brief, as was the case for all race engines needing an overhaul after each flight. And rather like the Curtis, as I said earlier, they learnt from each other during, it was very much a level up. The previous year, they incorporated uh, cooling into the wing mechanisms, albeit new approach. Supermean's test pilot, Baird, was never happy with it. The cockpit was too far back. He couldn't see where he was going. And he wasn't happy when he was testing it in Calshot. And when they flew, when they transported it out to, um, to, uh, to the US uh, and flew it in Baltimore, he wasn't happy there either. Disastrously, it, when it took off and it flew, it did a side slide from 200 feet and crashed into the water. And now, famously, the root cause of the crash was cited to be something called flutter. The wings fluttered. Um, it's a, a, a resonance process at a given airspeed, um, depending on the mass of the wing. The most famous dem demonstration of flutter, which is known, is, of course, the Tacoma Bridge disaster of 1940, which shows very clearly what flutter happens as the air passes over the bridge, the wind passed over the bridge, it started to resonate albeit at a slightly different frequency because a bridge weighs a lot more than an aircraft wing. <laughs> Beard was lucky to survive the crash, a real daredevil, daredevil. He came away with undiagnosed broken wrists and fractured ribs. Um, Flutter wasn't very well understood, but as a result of the development and the activity, it came to be well understood further during the, uh, because of this Schneider Trophy race. Also, it also prompted the air ministry to, to, to pull their finger out as well. And they decided at the end of 1925 to offer further financial support and wind tunnel testing of scale models. The 1926 event went back to the US again, um, and it was held in Chesapeake Bay across the, across the bay from NASA's Langley, where NASA's Langley facility is today. The main competition came from Italy with this beautiful Ferrari of an aircraft, which was directly funded by Mussolini. It had Fiat engines and a Mackey airframe. And being funded directly by Mussolini, it seems that if you're a, a, an Imperia's director, you can pretty much do anything. A totally new airplane it was developed incredibly quickly between February and the race later that year and it was a superb aircraft combining both surface radiators, uh, the duraluminium, the fairing, but here's a little story for you. A great story that I picked up from, um, uh, from another video is that uh, before it was shipped over from Italy to the US, the, uh, the floats which served as both fuel and oil or water tanks were thoroughly cleaned because in the US, the prohibition was on at the time. You just couldn't get a drink anywhere. The Italians cleaned out the floats and filled them up with Chianti. So they could all have a big party afterwards. And I'm not sure whether the fuel it flew on was Chianti, but who knows? The 1927 race went ahead, then next again in 29 and 31, biannually. biannually. Um, Supermarine uh, were struggling with float design at the time. Now, personally, as a windsurfer, 
I, I, I've windsurfed off uh, Witterings and South Sea, so I know what it looks like and feels like. And getting your windsurf board aquaplaning is quite a trick. The earlier flying boats had no problem at that, but these things struggled. Um, they were particularly draggy and required significant further development. The fuselage of this aircraft was now duraluminium monocoque with a light aluminium skin. Moving on from the S4's wood, uh, it was trimmed down and fared around the engine. Struts and bracing were optimized while the floats, as per this and the rules, became fuel, lubricant and water tanks. Pilot feedback was everything and they finally moved the, uh, the cockpit further forward so the pilot could see where he was going. The engines ran very hot and consumed ridiculous amounts of oil. And that brings me briefly onto the engines. In 1928, the government recognised that Rolls-Royce were increasingly turning their interest towards the luxury car market. And to pull them back from that, the, uh, the ministry proposed some funding to support engine development. Both an Napier on the left and Rolls-Royce is the R, the famous R engine as used in the uh, S5, well, the S6, sorry, in the S uh, series of aircraft were, were, were benefits, benefited from that investment. Um, Napier were pushing with a larger supercharger from its 24 litre engine, yeah, 24 litres. Meanwhile, Rolls-Royce were developing a new R series engine, which had an incredible 36 litre 12 V12 cylinder engine. Um, and it was the engine of choice for Supermarine because unlike the Napier, they felt that it had much further development to go. Um, and during the development of the, this particular engine for the 1929 race, Complaints were made by local residents in Derby about the incredible noise levels, no soundproofing or filtration, and it was vented directly to air. It doesn't look like safety measures were applied. Uh, no earmuffs were worn. Um, and if you think about it, the oil coming out the engine, it must have made a terrible mess. At one stage, it was burning 50 gallons of oil an hour. I mean, that's incredible and completely impractical, but the point is, it was how they developed the engines. The mess must have been awful, and no wonder the pilot couldn't see where he was going, all this oil going everywhere. But the power outputs achieved were phenomenal for its time, over 2,300 horsepower, horsepower for the air, and by then, they were down to only eight gallons of oil. The oil, interestingly, was castor oil. Um, this engine, here is on display in the Science Museum now. And compare this with the fact that the uh, Spitfire ran round about a thousand horsepower and only in the latter, later uh, uh, marks did they achieve over 1700 horsepower. The R was really a race beast of an engine. So on to the 29 race. This is the painting I have that really sparked my interest in this particular uh, uh, adventure. Um, it's on my wall and uh, it's been with me all my life because it belonged to my great grandfather. Um, this is the S6 N247, first flown in Calshot in August 1929. You can just see Waghorn here in his cockpit, open cockpit, with race number two on the side. Sadly, this aircraft exists no more. However, its, it's twin brother, the N248, is on display in the Solent Sky Museum. And I'm grateful to you, Ralph, for sending this picture and confirming that that's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I'll just show a, a few minutes of this video uh, to really reprise um, some of the aspects of the Schneider Trophy. Gives me a chance to Flight give my throat a rest. Darcy Craig. Flying officer R. L. R. Etcherman. 
the airframe and geometry was unchanged from the S5, more power from the R engine, an enormous oil tank behind the, few, behind the pilot's cockpit to contain all that oil, revised wing and float to accommodate all the extra weight, bigger floats, um, they were trading off, I think, hydrodynamic and aerodynamic aspects with the float design. Um, uh, they were also trying to reduce drag. And here you see number eight flown by Atchley. Earlier, I showed you number two flown by Waghorn. Here you see uh, the recording from the newsreel at the time. Flying across the Solent. You can catch sight of the church spire of cows. Here you see the, the, the VIP ship. Now this particular VIP ship was in the Solent and the, they could all see. And that was the Schneider Trophy of 1929, an incredible 328.64. How did they know it was 0.64? Well, the Schneider Trophy race uh, was timed by an eminent timekeeper of the time, F.T. Bidlake. They had perfect weather conditions on the day. Hundreds of thousands of people came to watch this great air race of its time. Um, it was very well publicised, very well attended. And uh, this particular picture is not the 1929, but the 1931 air race, where they were all got umbrellas because it was terrible. But the 1929, it was glorious weather. I don't think it was a coincidence that the VIP ship, the SS Orford, was built by Vickers. No. Guests were invited, of course, and a very fine dinner to celebrate the race was held afterwards on board. My great grandparents were both there. I like this photograph because it shows that it was very much a family affair and a, a, a team attended by wives and even the little dog gets in on the act. In 1931 the contest and the S6B, most of the developments, de developments seem to be about float design um, and cooling the engine. Um, I'm going to move rapidly now because I think I'm running out of time, but Boothman flew the 1595 to an incredible 340 miles per hour uh, cal shot. Um, again, it had the Rolls-Royce engine now up to this phenomenal 2350 horsepower. One thing to note is the, the paint peeling off. Now, I don't think it's a coincidence that the paint is peeling off because Essentially, they were using um, a methanol based uh, um, fuel um, to, to really tune the engine up. Um, the aircraft also achieved uh, an absolute world record of uh, over 400 miles an hour, which was achieved after the event by really pleading with the air ministry to allow them to go ahead and, and, do, and perform this particular uh, feat. So this ended the Schneider Trophy race um, because essentially uh, Britain had won it three years on the trot. But I want to go into the connection uh, before I finish, the connection with the Supermarine uh, Spitfire. As early as 1930, the Air Ministry issued a specification for a single seater aircraft armed with four Vickers guns and a radio. It was a thick gull winged aircraft with short undercarriage and an open cockpit. Not quite Mitchell's vision of the future, which you've just seen. Um, even if it was the ministry's vision. At the time, engine cooling systems were at top of the agenda and they proposed to use a steam evaporative system 
um, contrary to supermarines approach, one of uh, incorporating the radiators into the wings and later on the floats. The gull wing design also had stability problems, uh, such as, and other problems such as cockpit, open cockpit drag and air brakes meant that it was, the design was iterated many times before the ministry were even interested in looking at it. And when it first flew in 1934, uh, powered by a, a, a Rolls-Royce Kestrel engine, which by comparison with what they'd been working on uh, before with the R and then and the nascent Merlin engine, it, it was underpowered. Um, in the end, none of Supermarine's F-730 submissions gained favour with the Ministry. It almost seemed like they'd had it in for a moment, I think, case of, uh, case of that. Meanwhile, and this is pretty much my final slide, um, the ever persistent and confident Mitchell, back in Supermarine's DO, was concentrating his efforts on a new aircraft. This aircraft is familiar to everyone today. It had thin wings, copied from the seaplanes, and a canopy over the cockpit for aerodynamic reasons. Mitchell and Royce had formed a very good working relationship because of the air races, and for that reason, they ended up incorporating the new um, Rolls-Royce Merlin engine into the design. It also had Sadly for me, it didn't have floats, but it had fully retractable air undercarriage. Um, Mitchell had been already working on this improved design since the rejection of the F-730 early in 34. Then in November of that year, November 1934, at a Vickers Supermarine board meeting, um, at which my great grandfather was there, of course, the future of the F-730 project was considered and it was put forward by Vickers Supermarine that, that it should be completely re-engineered. With only the Gloucester passing flight trials, the Air Ministry had all their eggs in that basket. So they allowed Supermarine to go ahead and they gave them an open book in terms of design. It must have been a designer's dream. Now, and this is very much the end. Sir Robert McLean, head of Vickers, named the aircraft Supermarine at that board meeting. And as you can see from this particular article I'm showing here, it was actually my great grandfather who had the honour to write the letter to the Air Ministry. And he wrote, Dear Grinstead, confirming my telephone conversation this morning, Would you kindly reserve the name Spitfire for our day and night fighter now being built at Southampton? Now, th there's an irony to this story. Grinstead reply was until accepted for supply by the RAF to the RAF, it is requested that you will continue to refer to it not as Spitfire, but as Supermarine F-730. Now, the rest was history because during flight testing, subsequently, all the paperwork was headed up Spitfire. Amazing piece of history from my perspective to discover that my great grandfather was the man who wrote to the ministry to tell them they wanted to call this aircraft the Spitfire. In 1946, at the RA Royal Aeronautical Society's Christmas lecture, Joseph Smith who succeeded Mitchell as chief engineer designer of Supermarine in 1936, said that the main achievement was the engine. Personally, I think that's a very modest thing to say. Sadly, Mitchell was forced to retire in 1937 due to ill health um, and recurring cancer, and he died at the at young age of 42. His design legacy lives on through, lived on through his team at Supermarine working on the Spitfire, and Mitchell remains one of the most important figures in British aviation history. He's a name that we should all know by heart. And his son Gordon wrote his biography in 2011 uh, to capture many of the, 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 
these lessons. Schneider was reinvented in 1981 in name only as an open air race. Mitchell's legacy is not only in the, 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 the physical assets, but also the memory of the era, but also the attitude of steadfast self-belief in the face of limited resources and skeptical people. A wind tunnel built in 1930 was moved to Southampton University in 1981 and bears his name. Caddell, leading up to World War II, Caddell retired from Vickers in 1938 and joined uh, the company known as Duckham's, famous Duckham's Oil. Like Caddell, Duckham was a founder of British Aviation and they both gave generously to the RAF, Duckham donating his family at home. And I'll finish now with a few words from Duckham himself that was published in the Times a few days after his death. We've lost General Caddell, said Duckham, guide, philosopher and friend. As a gunner, remember his Royal Artillery background, he was one of the group of professional soldiers of vision and courage, who, prior to the last war, elected to forsake the land for the air. The professional being the trenchards, the salmons and the brankers, with support from the amateurs. They called them the amateurs, Rolls Royces, the de Havilland's and the Sopwiths, the amateurs, uh, were the forebears of the RFC. When that war came, we had the support of another soldier and visionary, Winston Churchill, and this gallant band hitched their wagon to a star. Your company, Duckham's, was privileged to play some part in that Caddo, your late director, was di director of general of aircraft production, and so came my contact with him. Post-war, he became industrial and joined Vickers, and on his retirement in 1938, we were fortunate to, uh, to, for him to join us. And with that, they raised a toast and said goodbye to Caddle. And with that, I end my speech. Just one final point, that man, Bidlake, uh, my own sport of cycling, Bidlake was very famous for setting all the rules about timekeeping in cycling in the 20s and 30s. No doubt why he was selected to be the timekeeper for the Schneider Trophy race. And a lot of his work formed how that works today. And it's only a short hop from where you'll see his memorial to the Shuttleworth Air Collection, where you'll see some of the aircraft I've displayed today. And with that, thank you very much. And I hope you've enjoyed my, uh, my, my lecture. I've run over slightly, I do apologize. And uh, if Ralph's on board, I'm sure we'll be available to take any, any questions. Thank you.